everyone. My name is Veronica Richardson. I'm a dermatology certified nurse practitioner and I practice in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm here today at Elevate Derm with Dr. Heather Woolery Lloyd. She joins us today uh, from the University of Miami. She is a dermatologist as well as the director of the Skin of Color division. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about what's new in skin of color. Yes. Um, so I'd love to hear from your perspective, what's new with melasma? So we all encounter melasma every day. We're pretty used to hydroquinone, but what's new? Are there any new treatments for melasma? So yes, there are a lot of great new treatments for melasma. The gold standard is hydroquinone, but we've been able to get away from hydroquinone a little bit because we have so many new alternatives to hydroquinone. So one of the new alternatives is an ingredient called thiamidol, which has been tested and compared to hydroquinone and it works really well. I do use it in my practice and it comes in a serum. There's also a day and a night cream that contains that ingredient. And when used together, I've seen really good efficacy for maintenance of my melasma patients. And there's another ingredient called lotus sprout extract, which comes in a combination with other active ingredients that work for melasma. They work synergistically together. I've used that in my practice. There's another new technology called PATH3. All of these things have been compared to hydroquinone and have been shown to be effective in melasma. That's really exciting. And when we're looking at these studies with these new treatments for melasma, is there anything that we should keep in mind knowing that patients with darker skin types, type four, five, and six, tend to have more difficult to treat melasma? What yes. should we be looking for in these studies? So I always say to look at the demographics of the study when you're looking at a product that's been used for pigment. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't work in darker skin types if it's only tested in types one through three skin, but you definitely have to understand that to know what you should expect in your darker skin patients. So I always want my studies to include darkly pigmented patients because then I'll know how it will work in the patients who complain of hyperpigmentation the most, which is skin types four through six. So I always look at those studies, look at the demographics, make sure that all skin types are well represented before you interpret the study results. Makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you. Um, you know, one of the other conditions that we see quite a bit in our African-American female patients is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia and can be really difficult to treat. And it's really historically, a lot of blame has been paced you know, placed on the patient in terms of hairstyling practices really being to blame uh, for the condition. And I know we really want to decouple that when we're talking with our patients with CCCA. Um, and, you know, you had mentioned a new discovery about a gene, PADI3. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so PADI3 is a gene that has been implicated in patients with CCCA. We do think that CCCA is hereditary. It seems to pa be passed along in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So it's something that I see in my patients. I'll say my mother had this or my aunt had this, or even a male relative can have it because CCCA can even occur in men. And so studies now suggest that it's definitely, there's a strong genetic component to CCCA and PADI3 is the gene that seems to be implicated. Very interesting. And then finally, one thing that you spoke about was um, a new culprit for hyperpigmentation, especially a photosensitive hyperpigmentation on the skin. Um, and I think it's a little bit unexpected and it was really something that we all kind of said, oh wow, never thought about that. So what is that? So this new culprit for hyperpigmentation is called Kratom. And it's something that's sold over the counter. You can buy it online. It's used as an analgesic, as a sedative. It has opioid-like properties and it's gaining a lot of popularity so it's widely available as a powder that people can add to teas and so forth. And it has a potential for overuse and it has been reported to cause a photo accentuated hyperpigmentation. And it really has that very strong photo distributed pattern. So if you see a patient with new onset photo distributed, photo accentuated hyperpigmentation, that's something for you to think about in your differential diagnosis. Well, thank you so much for providing us with these pearls. I think we'll all take them with us to our daily practice. So thank you so much. Thank you.